Thanks everyone for making the time to join us. Uh, our speaker today needs no introduction, uh, but in the interest of young roboticists in the audience, we are going to give him one. Um, our speaker is Professor Dieter Fox from the University of Washington, uh, where he leads the Robotics and State Estimation Lab. At the same time, he's the Senior Director of Robotics Research at NVIDIA. And his, groups have, uh, his group have, has produced extremely uh, cool results in robotics and perception in the last uh, few years. So Dieter obtained his PhD from the University of Bonn in Germany. Uh, his research is in robotics and uh, artificial intelligence with focus on state estimation and perception applied to problems such as mapping, object detection and tracking, uh, manipulation and activity recognition. Uh, he has published more than 200 technical papers and he's the co-author of the famous textbook uh, Probabilistic Robotics. And even though Dieter would be the first to tell you that the Probabilistic Robotics book could benefit from incorporating recent, recent advances in deep learning, uh, both the book and his papers have been extremely influential in the robotics community. Uh, and it is very hard to imagine what our field would look like without uh, these contributions. Uh, Dieter has received many awards and distinctions for his work. Uh, he's a fellow of the IEEE and the AAAI, and the recipient of the 2020 uh, Pioneer in uh, Robotics and Automation Award. Dieter also received several Best Papers Awards at major conferences in robotics, AI, and computer vision. Uh, he was also an editor of the IEEE Transactions on Robotics, uh, program co-chair of uh, AAAI uh, and uh, RSS as well. So please join me in giving me in giving Dieter the warmest of welcomes. All right, I'll start sharing. Yeah, thank you so much for, first of all, for the invitation. And of course, I would have preferred to see you all in person and, and for the very, very kind introduction. Um, yeah, so um, as Florian said, I, um, I'm currently on a, actually on a 50-50 position, which means I spent half my time at the University of Washington and half my time at NVIDIA. I uh, joined the position at NVIDIA three years ago in order to start a robotics research lab. And in the talk here, I will mostly focus on the work that we've done in that lab. Um, over the, last, over the last three years and kind of just give you an, an, an overview of the different kind of topics we, we looked at in that time. Uh, so the, the main mission of the lab is really kind of to do basic robotics research in order to enable this next generation of robots, especially robot manipulators that can perform complex tasks in um, open-ended, possibly unknown environments and interact with people in a natural way. And applications for these kind of robots are, of course, in various areas. There could be, on the one hand, let's say, next generation industrial robotics use cases, as we see more and more coming up nowadays, also with many startups in this area. But even in the healthcare sector, home care sector, where robots can help people hopefully lead an independent life and ultimately just in the, in, in, in the general way of helping people in the home. Um, or in hospital settings or so. Um, there are many, many applications of these robots. And it turns out that uh, the problems in this area are still extremely difficult. And there's a, a lot of research that still has to be done if we want to enable these kind of use cases. So in the lab, we're looking at kind of the basic capabilities that these robots need. And the research um, we're trying to drive also um, through kind of integrated systems, meaning we're not looking at small isolated pieces of the puzzle, but trying to put them together and solve kind of uh, larger scale problems, because I think um, that helps a lot in kind of seeing what the really hard cases are and, and, and what the, um, the, the missing techniques are that we still need to solve. Um, so one problem we started looking at um, early on is kind of a, a kitchen scenario where ultimately, of course, it would be nice to have a robot that can uh, cook your meal and clean up the dishes and everything. Um, but uh, on the shorter um, term, even on the research front, you're saying, um, can we put a robot in a kitchen and um, just pick up objects, get them out of a cabinet or a drawer and move them onto the table, things like that. Just manipulating basic objects um, turns out to be a non-trivial task. And um, for that, we built actually a, a kitchen in the lab. So you can see this here on the upper left. Uh, that kitchen is actually uh, just an IKEA kitchen we bought um, 
kind of down the down the street in, in Seattle. Um, and why I like the kitchen is just because it stands in for many, many, many different application domains, right? You could imagine any kind of general home, home robotics, but even in robots working in hospital, industrial settings, many of the problems that you face in these other domains, you can also kind of investigate in a kitchen scenario. Um, and there, of course, are, yeah, many application domains, even if you can make progress on the kitchen itself. But again, have in mind, the main goal is not only doing kitchens, but uh, just investigating the general problems that come up in many of these uh, manipulation scenarios. Um, so I'm, I'm going to organize a talk by kind of walking you through the different components that we've been working on uh, towards this kind of kitchen uh, manipulation system. And um, here's uh, an, an, another kind of overview picture of what it looks like. So we have a robot on a mobile base. A robot is a, is a, a Franca Panda robot, um, seven degrees of freedom. And for perception, we put, you can see this here on the right, we have two depth cameras that we installed in the ceiling of the kitchen. So the depth cameras would observe the robot and objects and the cabinets. Um, ultimately, of course, you would wanna have a camera on the robot itself, um, kind of looking over the, maybe the shoulder of the manipulator, but uh, we just haven't installed yet. So, but clearly that is what you would wanna have. Also for some of the research, we also put a small camera onto the gripper of the robot so that you can get a closer up view onto the objects. But for the first part, um, let's assume we only have these two cameras that observe that small area of the kitchen. And I'm not even gonna talk about the navigation aspects of this. I'm really gonna focus more on the um, manipulation side of the problem here. So if you wanna put together such a manipulation system, there are different kinds of ingredients. Um, and the, the first one is what's called task and motion planning, where the idea is um, imagine, and, and that's actually an important assumption we are making here, you have a 3D model of the kitchen, which means you know exactly the shape of the drawers and um, the cabinets and the doors. Um, you, have, you know how they are articulated, how they open and close. Um, you, we also assume that we have 3D models of the objects that could be in the kitchen. And then under this assumption, and if you even, let's assume you know where the objects are, then there is one task that's called task and motion planning, where you, you have like the current configuration of your kitchen and the objects, and you're trying to put them into a target configuration and task and motion planning tries to figure out what kind of sequence of controls the robot has to execute in order to do this. So for example, to put um, an object that's in a drawer, to put it on a table, it first has to kind of get close to the drawer, it has to open the drawer so that the object becomes accessible, and all these kind of planning steps have to be performed in order to, um, to achieve that task. Now, if you want to execute that in the real world, you need to work on something that's called state estimation and perception, where the idea is you use the the um, sensor data, like in this case, the depth cameras, for example, in order to figure out what's going on in the environment. So where are the objects, which doors are open or closed and things like that. So this is a, a broad, of course, area in robotics in general. Um, another aspect is um, for objects, how do you actually grasp an object? From which direction do you wanna bring in the gripper in order to pick it up? And also how do you reason about placing it back onto into onto the surface, for example, or into a drawer. And once you have all of this now in real time, if the robot should um, operate that in the environment, you also need to generate real time smooth trajectories for the manipulator so that it avoids collisions, for example. And you need to send these controls at a very high uh, frequency, for example, at a thousand Hertz, whereas other parts of this uh, reasoning system can operate at, at, at just 30 hertz or even less in order to do the planning. So let me, let me now give you some examples for um, the, the, the kind of research we've done in these different areas. So the first one is um, on object pose estimation, where the idea is if you want to manipulate objects in the kitchen, of course, the robot needs to figure out where they are. And we're using here the depth cameras. So 60 object pose estimation is first of all, it's 
not only 3D but 6D because you want to know the translation and the 3D rotation of an object in order to specify exactly where it is relative to the robot. And the idea in this case is imagine you have a 3D model of an object. And in our case, we're using objects from the, it's called the YCD data set. This is uh, the, the Cheez-It box. And again, you have a textured 3D model of the object. And now you have an image taken by the camera on the robot or by an external camera. And you want to know exactly where the Cheez-It box is in that scene, meaning the 3D translation and 3D orientation of the object. Okay? So that's the object pose estimation, also detection task. And um, the research community has developed many, many techniques for, for this um, problem. Um, most of them focus on analyzing a single image, which means if you have a single image and you try to infer from that uh, what the pose of the object is, many of them really also aim at coming up with a single estimate, like a single best guess of the 60 pose of the objects. Um, there's been also some work on tracking the object pose through time. Uh, many of them rely on techniques like, like Kalman filtering. Of course, if you can solve the single image pose estimation problem extremely well, then you can just repeat that 30 times a second and that gives you a tracking techniques, technique, but you can also imagine that temporal smoothing might improve on these approaches. And um, most of these techniques, again, um, are designed to just estimate kind of a single estimate or a local Gaussian estimate for the 60 pose. And it turns out one, one thing we realized is that actually in many cases, a single estimate for the 60 pose of an object isn't really well specified. And um, I'm gonna give you one example for some work we've done on dealing with the fact that there is this high uncertainty specifically in the object orientation. Um, by the way, if any questions come up, I'm not sure how to indicate that to me, but um, please let me know. I'll be happy to answer questions as they come up during the presentation. Okay. Um, so again, we've done uh, also some work on the single image, just a single pose estimation, but I want to give you one example for something um, where we go beyond just a single estimate, but we are trying to come up with a full 60 distribution over the position of the object, okay? And this work is called pose RBPF. And why that is relevant, I wanna, I wanna describe to you here, where imagine you have this actually 3D model of a tuna can, and that's your observation, and you wanna estimate the 60 pose of this object, it turns out from that single image, um, you cannot uniquely determine from where you're looking at the object. So um, if what I visualize here is, kind of the object and these two kind of circles around the objects, they indicate camera poses from which you might be looking at the object given the ob observation. So which means you cannot resolve the orientation from which you're looking at the object and you also cannot resolve whether you're looking from kind of from the top down or from the bottom up, okay? So based on the symmetric shape of the object, there's just no way you can resolve that and give you. Now you might say, okay, we're gonna use textured object models. If you use color on the object, then you can actually uniquely determine the pose. So for example, now your observation becomes a colored, let's say 3D observation still with depth cameras, but with color now. And by using that texture information, you can now uniquely, for example, determine from which orientation you're looking at the object. And that can be useful in certain cases when that orientation, for example, matters. But even if you use color, it doesn't totally break any kind of symmetry. So um, the uncertainty very much still depends on the viewpoint and the context in which you're operating. So for example, if you have this textured colored object, if you're looking at it purely from the top or from one side, even with texture models, you cannot resolve whether you're looking at the object from the top or from the bottom, and you cannot resolve the orientation at which you're looking at. Okay, so this is why um, these kind of uncertainties cannot just simply be pre-specified. Um, it depends very much on the context and on the sensor data. And this brought us to the idea of trying to really capture the full distribution over these uncertainties over time as we're tracking an object. Okay, so um, the idea is actually based on some really nice work 
that Rudy Trebel's team uh, published at ECCB. This was actually the best paper at ECCB 2018. And they learned in order to um, reason about viewpoints onto an object, they used a um, technique called autoencoders to learn view-based similarities um, for an object. So let me, let me just describe to you briefly how this works. Imagine you have a 3D model of an object, okay? And what they train is a deep neural network that consists of an encoder that takes as input on the left here a noisy view onto this object. And they, you can artificially add noise to this in synthetic data generation. And they go through a bottleneck, in this case, 128 dimensional bottleneck. Um, and that, such that you can decode from this bottleneck a clean image onto the object from the same viewpoint, okay? And during training, you just keep on presenting pairs of input noisy image, output clean image. And the idea is that by doing this, you enforce that autoencoder to represent in this 128 dimensional vector kind of a view information onto the object, okay? So different views onto the object will result, result in different um, embedding vectors. Um, if the object is symmetric, then different views onto the object might actually result in the same embedding vector, but that is totally fine in this context. So what you can do with this is now you can take, um, you can generate many different views onto the object. In their case, it was like 92,000 different orientation from which you might look at the object. And for each of these orientations, you just store the embedding vector, the 128 dimensional vector. And now at test time, what you can do is the following. Um, we throw away the decoder, we don't need that anymore. You present it with a certain image of the object. You encode it into its corresponding um, embedding. And then you just compare that vector to the vectors in your codebook. okay? And the similarity between tells them how similar that view is to one of the predefined views that you have in your codebook. And then what they did is they just take the view that is most similar, for example, this one, and that gives them the orientation estimation for this object. Okay, and it turns out this works very well. Um, and it is able to deal with symmetric object, or at least it is not confused by the fact that they are symmetric objects. And um, in their case, they showed again that it works very well for symmetric objects. Um, they did not reason at the time about translation. And also their analysis was based on a single image and they only wanted a single estimate for the view. So, but based on this, we now wanted to extend this into a full 60 post tracking system. Okay, but have in mind that this is kind of the basic underlying idea that we're gonna use here. And for 60 post tracking, in robotics, there's many different techniques you can apply. You can do Kalman filtering, um, pure particle filtering. Um, and, and we are using a technique here that is called um, Rao black -like particle filter. I'm not gonna go into the details, but I think the intuition is, is reasonably simple. The technique then overall is called post-RBPF, post Rao post black -like particle filter, where the idea is Again, we want to represent a six dimensional distribution over the object's position and orientation. And instead of, for example, sampling just into this six dimensional space, because it's um, uh, computationally very complex to have enough samples in that space, we break it into two pieces where we say, we're going to sample X, Y, Z positions for the objects, which means the translation. And for each of these samples now, we're gonna um, represent a discretized version of the 3D orientation space, okay? And by breaking that into these two pieces, it turns out that you can have actually a more accurate and uh, sample efficient representation of the distribution. Let me just show you what this means in a, in a specific example here. So now our particle filter consists of samples in the space where each sample again has a 3D translation and a full orientation distribution. In our case, the orientation distribution, as you can see here on the right, consists of more than 190,000 bins, 
And each of these spins represents a different view onto the object. And this is three-dimensional roll pitch yaw. Okay. So now what we can do is for a particle, let's assume we have an observation of, um, in this case, I think we care about the blue um, water mark and the 3D translation of the particle can be transformed into a bounding box in the image, right? If we know the X, Y, Z and we know the model of the object, we know what the bounding box in the image should be. We can now crop this into this region of interest for the particle. From this region of interest, we can use the technique that I showed you on the previous slide, encode it into this um, particle code and now compare it to the code book for this object, which gives us now, by matching it against this code book, a likelihood for all possible rotations of the object. Okay, so have in mind that again, now the code book consists of 191,000 bins, but um, since we have a GPU, we can run this all in parallel and it's just vector comparison, so it can be done super, super efficiently. Also have in mind that we need to do this for each individual particle. Okay, so these comparisons are not done once for the particle filter, but each individual particle does that. And once we have these rotation likelihoods, we can update a per particle distribution over the orientation. Okay, let me just show you how this now works. So what you see here on the left is we're tracking the coffee mark and these green squares, they indicate these region of interest of the different particles. And on the right hand side, you can see the distribution over the orientation for let's say the best particle. We only show it for one. And what's interesting here is initially the camera does, is, is viewing the mark from an orientation where you cannot see the handle. So you can see here on the right that the orientation uncertainty is actually pretty high because you, can, you do not know from where you're looking at the coffee mark if you don't see the handle. Okay, and now let me show you as we're starting to move the camera how the, this distribution evolves. So again, very high uncertainty over the orientation, but at some point the handle comes into view and you can see now that this distribution over the orientation also becomes much more peak because that information becomes available. Okay. And we can also, because it's just particle filtering, we can also do global localization, which means we can't need to do object detection with this framework. Where in this case, let's say we want to track the cheese it or detect the cheese it box. And initially, we're just spreading 5,000 particles, which is XYZ positions, into the 3D space in front of the camera. You can see this on the right side. All these green kind of grids are parts of the bounding boxes. And after the first observation and resampling, we already have far fewer bounding boxes and they're all kind of concentrated on the right kind of um, object. And then over time, we can actually even now track this object. Importantly, you can see that this can handle actually pretty well also occlusions like in this case um, through the drill. And that's because in the training data, we also have occlusions when we learn the encoders. Okay, and again, because we can do all of this on the GPU, um, we can run this filter with 50 particles at the time, 20 frames per second, but now Chinke actually did some more optimizations of this, so we can easily do this at 30 frames a second. So, uh, question? Yeah. Uh, so, uh, would you handle uh, scale in, in the same way that you handle uh, rotations? So showing different, uh, basically doing domain randomization uh, for a known object. So you do you mean during training? Yeah, exactly. For the to train the encoder. So during training of the encoder, we actually assume um, we we train it at a at a around a certain scale that is kind of normalized, mm -hmm. and then we can in the particle case we can rescale that back to the bounding box size. So the bounding boxes don't all have the same sizes. The size of these bounding boxes then uh, depends on the, the distance to the object. Good. Okay. Because you want the particles, you want the encoder actually to be somewhat um, uh, sensitive to scale, right? Because otherwise you cannot 
distinguish where the object is. Mm -hmm. All right. So this is about, let's say, 60 object pose estimation. Um, and um, we, for now, let's also, we're mostly actually not really using the full distribution here, but this was just also to get to a robust um, estimation and tracking system. But now what we need to do next is kind of estimate really more of the quantities of what's going on in the environment, which is more this kind of what we call state estimation. Um, so here we're using a technique um, that a student of mine, Tanner, developed at University of Washington. It's called DART, where the idea is we have articulated objects in the environment and articulated objects could be things like, in, in, in that case, a, a person or a robot or cabinet doors and drawers. These are um, objects that consist of individually rigid parts that can move against each other according to some kind of rotations typically. And the idea is we're using depth cameras in order to track them through time. Okay, so here are just some examples of what this dart tracking can do with depth cameras, where you can track, for example, human hands or human bodies. On the right hand side, we use this to track a robot manipulator and an object being manipulated by the object. And this is just more or less just matching depth data against an articulated object through then optimization. Um, of the, the kind of residual between the point clouds and the model using sign distance function representations for the object models. Okay. Um, the problem with this technique, it's local. So which means it has to be initialized with a reasonably good estimate for the poses of these individual components. Okay. Um, so here, just one example now in the kitchen setting, what we are tracking with the depth cameras and with this framework, um, you can see here where in the upper left, you can see the robot itself operating in the kitchen. And in the lower left, you can see kind of the internal tracked model of the robot where we are tracking the manipulator where it is in the kitchen. We are tracking the objects that you can see here colored. So they are detected using the 60 pose estimation that I just described. And then they are tracked in this framework, this DART framework. And also we're tracking the different cabinets and drawers and doors of the kitchen, as you will see here in green. And all of this can be done just by optimizing over the parameters of this environment. Okay, let me just show you now. Um, so here you can see the robot actually opening one of the cabinet doors. Right, and again, we're using the depth camera data to track the cabinet door as it's being opened because that is what the robot is using for things like collision checking, um, path planning, and now it can pick up the object using the pose estimate and uh, it can put it into, for example, in this case, into the cabinet. Okay, now of course, big caveat here is that we assume that all the object models and the environment are known well. But under this assumption, the system actually works reasonably robust. Okay, so uh, the next component also is now that we, let's say we know what's going on in the environment is uh, what we call reactive manipulator control, which means now we need to send um, at a very high frequency, we need to control commands to the robot. And for that, we're using a framework uh, that Nathan Ratliff developed. It's called Riemannian motion policies. I just wanna give you the intuition. Here is where the pro problem for robot manipulator control is the following, while the robot operates in this 3D space, like as you can, let's say, see here a robot picking up this, this cup from a drawer, actually the, the control space of the robot lives in the, in the joint space of the robot, which in this case is seven dimensional, which means we need to generate trajectories through this seven dimensional joint space, such that, for example, the robot reaches a goal configuration in the 3D task space of the robot while avoiding obstacles and things like that. And we need to generate these control commands at a, at a very high rate um, and, and very quickly. And these Riemannian motion policies is a, is a mathematically very nice framework that lets you develop these policies um, in, a, in a kind of intuitive way. And um, let me just give you one brief um, uh, intuition for what's going on here. 
where on the right hand side you can see, um, and of course I encourage you to look at all the guys of the publications we have on these topics, but the Q, this would be, let's say, the joint space of the robot, which is a seven dimensional configuration because the robot has seven joints for one arm in this case. And for this joint configuration, we can now specify points in the 3D operational space of the robot, right? This is where the robot actually operates. So these are 3D points, x1 through x3. And we, in reality, of course, generate uh, many more on the surface of the robot. And for each of these, we can now also compute, for example, features such as the distance to the closest obstacle to them, right? And we can do this, of course, very efficiently using techniques like sine distance functions and things like that. Um, and what we can now define is, given these distances, we can define for all these points, we can define what's called local acceleration policies, which means where does this point want to move given its local context? So for example, uh, these accelerations, they want the robot to not move into obstacles, but they are okay moving parallel to obstacles. Um, at the same time, for example, we want the grip to move towards the goal point on an obstacle that it wants to pick up, okay? So um, again, these motion policies give you a nice way of finding um, these policies um, in the workspace of the robot, but then mapping them back to the joint space of the robot, okay? And that then can result in these very nice, I think very elegant and reactive policies. So here this robot, doesn't like or open drawers. And this is Nathan kind of teasing it. And you can see that the robot actually very nicely react to these changes in the environment. And we are tracking them using depth cameras that, and, and the, the DART technique that I just described on the previous slides too. Okay, so, and I also encourage you if you wanna know more about that, Nathan just gave um, a, a, a tutorial at the call conference. And I think all of these are accessible online if you want to know more details about that technique and also the extensions of it, okay? More recent extensions. So Birr, we have one, uh, one question about the loss function in Dart. Um, the question is, can you explain what the physics term is about? In O, oh, that was on the previous, on the Dart, I think, yeah, the physics term in the Dart. So for example, we did some work. Um, if you just match, for example, point cloud data, right, to match the position of an object on the table, what can happen is that, for example, the, po the object interpenetrates with the table. So it's physically not consistent or it's not consistent with the physics. So you can have additional physical constraints that say, for example, that the object should not interpenetrate another object that it should be sitting on the table. Um, also, if the robot has a touch sensor, for example, when it's grasping an object, then if the sensor says that the finger is in contact with the object, we can add that as a constraint to the optimization such that the tracked finger is also in contact with the tracked object. So making kind of the, the, the essence consistent with the physics of the world. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. All right. Um, so now that we have this nice, um, these motion policies, here's an example um, uh, of some additional work that, that Chris Paxton did on these logical dynamical systems with, for example, if you want the robot now to operate in this environment and it has already a, a certain plan for what it should do, then we, we can now also quickly react to, um, changes in the plan. Oh, well, the, the sound should be not too disruptive here. But here, for example, robot wants to open the drawer and Chris is just kind of pulling it away and it can react to this. And it wants to put the spam box into the drawer. And during execution, it's constantly also tracking the logical state of the environment. So for example, it knows that the precondition for um, putting them into the drawer is that the drawer is open. So now that precondition was violated because Chris closed the drawer again. So what can in real time react to these and then update its plan accordingly. Okay, 
or in this case, he's moving the box and the robot can be active. Okay. Um, in the interest of time, I'm gonna keep on moving forward here. So this is kind of this reactive execution of these plans. Um, we've also done work on the high level task and motion plan work that Caden Garrett um, did during an internship. Um, he, he's, his thesis is on task and motion planning. And um, we can now connect these high level planners to the real world using these perception systems that we have. So here, for example, um, the task of the robot is find the spam box in one of the two drawers that they are. We don't know in which one it is and then place it in the other. Okay, so in cadence you can do all the high level reasoning that is necessary for doing this. So for example, you first open the bottom one, you look at it and you see what in this. So you close it again so that you can now open the top one, you detect the spam, and now you can plan to kind of, you need to get it onto the countertop, close it again so that you can put it into the bottom drawer. So that's a nice part. Once you have good um, tracking and estimation system, you can now do these kind of really high level task planning and execution in the real world. Okay. However, let me point out again, the key caveat here is that assume that we have a complete model of the environment and that we have uh, models even of the object instances. Okay, so now I wanna move on to some other line of work that is going towards grasping unknown objects. So how can we pick up objects for which we do not have models at all or objects that the robot has never seen before, okay? I think ultimately this is of course where we have to go, right? Um, to train, and for this we're using um, um, deep learning and um, to learning you need, of course, a lot of uh, training data. And in this case, we're using, of course, NVIDIA's um, uh, physics simulation engines, uh, Flex and Physics, we can actually just take 3D models of ob objects, I think they're from ShapeNet, and you can just randomly try thousands of different ways of how you might try to grasp that object and then use physics simulation to check out if that grasp was or not. Okay, and you can do this in parallel on GPUs again. Um, and now what you have is, let's say you have thousands of objects and for each object, you might have thousands of successful grasps. Okay, and this now becomes your training data where for each object, you know the relative 60 poses of the gripper, which if the gripper approaches the object from that direction, you have a high chance of success. Okay, so this is the training data. And um, with this training data, we train a network that's called Sixth of GraspNet, where the idea is we really want to do the 60 pose of the gripper relative to the object in order to pick it up. And the input to the net network is just a point cloud of the segmented object. Okay, so um, here's the input, which is cloud observing the object and, and have in mind that uh, there might be occlusions and things like that. Then we have a network that is a so-called conditional variational order encoder that is trained on this, I just showed you on the previous slide, to sample grasps that have a high chance of succeeding. It's our grasp sampler network, and I'll give you a bit more in, uh, information on that on the next slide. Um, and then we have another network that actually takes one of these sample grasps, so it's a discriminative network that takes one of these uh, sample grasps and evaluates whether there's a, this grasp has a high chance of succeeding on. So it's kind of like a like an additional safety check for the sampling network, and. Um, the nice thing about this network on the right side is um, because it's differentiable, of course, we can actually use this network not only to evaluate whether a grasp is successful, but we can compute the probability of success with respect to the grasp pose and differentiate through the network in order to refine the grasp. Okay, so that we can then generate a set of grasps for an object that has a high chance of success. And I think in the interest of, I'm gonna go just very quickly for the sampling network, 
But the idea is the following. Um, we present to the network a object, which is the point load of the object, and the rotation of tra and translation of a successful grasp. And then just as we did for the post tracking, we're feeding this through an encoder network. The encoder maps this information now to a 2D latent value. Uh, you could also do 3D or 4D, but let's assume here we're, we're actually using 2D latent value. And what's different in this case is the network is trained such that from this 2D latent value, along with the point cloud of the object, we can recover the six dimensional grasp. Okay, so that's important, which means we have a 6D grasp that we encode in a 2D latent space, but we do this in the context of the object. Okay, because otherwise you couldn't just downscale, down, downscale the 6D to the 2D space. But we do so because we assume that the successful grasp for an object can live in a 2D submanifold. Okay, and this is trained on just many examples of object point clouds and successful grasps, okay? So um, here's what this might look like now. On the left side, you see the object. And on the right side, you see this learned embedding space. And you can see different grasps that correspond to different positions in this 2D latent space, okay? On the right side, this is kind of different points in the latent space, but you can see that they kind of represent the gripper kind of wrapping around that rim of the, of the bowl. Importantly, the interpretation of the latent space, as I mentioned, depends on the object itself, which means, for example, if we take the same network with different objects, we get different graphs. Okay, so you can see that the same network, we don't have to train a network per object, we train a single network on all these objects and um, it generates a graph for these different objects that have a high chance of succeeding. Okay. And the nice thing is this actually works very well on real world objects then. So in this case, uh, we show you some graphs for the, again, YCB objects. Uh, importantly, the system was solidly trained in simulation using physics simulation and depth data. And the objects that you see here, the models of these objects were not part of the training data. So this is truly unknown objects um, and sim to real transfer. It doesn't always work perfectly well. Like if you look on the lower right, like the coffee mug, it kind of, it wants to go for the handle in this case, but somehow it's just missing it by a centimeter or so. Okay. But this system is actually uh, works surprisingly well. Okay, so now what we can do is we can, let's say, pick up unknown objects if they are singulated and in follow up work, we looked at um, extended this so that we can do this also in more cluttered scenes. Again, and for unknown objects. So the idea here is the following. Uh, if you look at the right side. So this is the input image that the robot sees and we're using a camera that's on the grip of the robot. And we have a technique that can do segmentation of unknown objects. Okay. And let's assume you want to pick up this object, the, the, the white coffee mug or coffee cup in this case. Um, again, the robot doesn't reason about object types. This is all independent of object. But someone might say that this is the object I, wanna, I want you to pick up. So now we're using the grasp net to generate grass for um, picking this object up. But we also have an additional network um, that checks for occlusions. And in this case, the network determines that none of the graphs are actually available because they are in collision with other objects in the scene. Okay, so in this case, what we can do is we can just say, let's just com uh, compute which of these other objects mostly um, uh, are responsible for the failure of the grasp, which means the ones that are mostly occluding the grasp. In this case, the system determined automatically that the sugar box is the one that's mostly responsible. So now we can just automatically go back and say, okay, let's ignore the coffee mug for a moment and say, we wanna pick up the sugar box, okay? So now the system goes back and says, okay, I wanna pick up the sugar box. 
generate grass for them. And then in this case, it actually determines that it can pick it up. And now the robot picks up the sugar box, gets it out of the way, puts it somewhere else. And now we can just go back to the original scene, reassess and check whether now we can pick up the coffee cup. And in this case, occlusion is taken off and the robot can pick it up. So what this demonstrates is that even though the system is not operating on object types or something like that, it can already do things that are handling more um, complex scenes. And we're also extending this now for um, trajectory optimization and planning using um, trained collision checks into account. Okay, so the idea is we want to be able to do more and more complicated tasks without relying on object models and without relying on um, specific object detectors if um, not necessary. Uh, sorry to interrupt. There are two. Yeah. Uh, there are two questions in the in the chat. So Tim, do you want to go over first with your question? Oh sure. I just wanted to know what the intuition was for why the the latent space for the graphs would only be two D. Was that determined experimentally, or yes. how did you come up with that? Most, so let's say um, I think Arsalan he tried also different dimensions. Of course, if you go in this case, if you go to sixty, then you can just copy, and, and you're not learning really anything, right? So it should be lower than the sixty uh, original grass space. And we try 2D and 3D, um, for example, and I think the, the performance was very, very similar. Um, I think, yeah, mostly, to, to be honest, it's experimentally. And in this case, I chose also 2D because it visualizes much easier than 3D. The next uh, question is from uh, Kiros. Kiros, do you want to? Sure. I guess um, is there is there an, uh, any um, any physics encoded in, in in this grasping process? For example, you know, would you grasp a an empty cup the same way that you would grasp a cup full of coffee, or mm -hmm. an empty box versus a box full of full of stuff? A friction, That's a great point. Uh, distribution of mass, you know, things like that. That's a great point. No, the grasping right now, the way it is, um, the, especially the, the the last part, right? There's no reasoning about that. And the advantage, of course, if you have things like object models and things like that, then you can encode those, those uh, kind of physics. We haven't done that for the, for the unknown object grasping yet, but um, I can well imagine, depending on how you present the, the, the training data, um, you might make some progress towards that, but I think ultimately you need to have more complicated reasoning about these objects, right? Where you actually want to um, maybe even reason about object completion and ultimately, obviously, about object types as well, as well right? So clearly, uh, there's this whole line of research toward object affordances and things like that, right? Where it's not only about how you pick up an object uh, just for the sake of picking it up, but for, uh, for the sake of operating the object, right? And um, that's clearly an important direction uh, to move into as well. Thanks. Uh, Abhishek, I will get to your question at the end of the talk. Thanks, Didier. Okay, one, one brief part um, uh, is on, again, on simulation. And I already showed you that we can use simulation for, for training. Um, the, the different components that I showed you, especially the, like the learning components. I think simulation is going to be um, a really, really important part for training these kind of systems uh, in, in the future. Um, in this case, uh, what's interesting is we actually, for this kitchen that we had, uh, that we got from IKEA, uh, we also generated a physics model of the same kitchen with the so-called content creation team at NVIDIA. Of course, NVIDIA, that's the great thing. They know a lot about physics simulation. They know a lot about um, photorealistic rendering and um, 3D modeling of environment. So what you see here is actually the robot executing something in the real world and in the other version in the simulated world. And I, th I think you hopefully agree with me that it's not super duper obvious which is which actually anymore. Okay. Um, so I think this is just an indication. And this video is already now almost two years old. So 
um, that it is possible to now go to become kind of really close enough to the real world such that we can really train and test our robot systems in these environments. Now, the big caveat from my perspective is really with respect to content creation. So for example, generating this realistic kitchen model took a lot of time and a lot of effort. The, the main designer, Johnny Costello, he actually said that that was harder building than building a model of the Death Star for, for Star Wars. And that is because if you build a model for just for a movie, let's say, um, and you say something doesn't look right, you can just move the wall a little bit or something like that, right? Or, or the color. But if you want to build a model of something that is actually physically, that exists physically, then you need to make it as accurate enough relative to the physical world and to the layout of the physical world. And how to generate these kind of models um, is just uh, still a very tedious process. So content creation for these environments is still a very, very open problem. And as of course, I'm, I'm sure you all know, like Sonia Fiedler is working a lot on, on this topic and I think that's a really promising direction. So how can we, for example, automatically generate thousands of kitchens in which we need to train these robots so that they can become really capable in general. Okay, so that's, that's a really important and exciting direction. Uh, how we're using then vision and simulation is, for example, here this is a collaboration um, also with, with um, BMW, and this is the Isaac SDK team where they now use kind of these rendered simulated images to train detectors for, in this case, it's this blue, it's kind of a, it's called a dolly that they have to move around. And they also want to learn, train a robot so that it can dock onto it. So you can see, you can really generate pretty photorealistic data to train your detectors on, on, on this kind of tasks. Um, another example for how we can use simulation for training, this is work that we did with Yevgen Chebota, an intern, uh, where the idea is uh, we want to have this kind of peg in hole. In this case, it's a bit complicated because the peg itself hangs off a rope and let's assume you don't know exactly how long the real world rope is, how big the pack is and things like that. And the idea is, um, of course, what one topic I'm sure you heard of is domain randomization, where the idea is we just sample over possible physical worlds, for example, different lengths of ropes and things like that, and then um, use real world, oh, use, wait, let me, and then use real world examples in order to refine these randomization parameters. And over time, then the simulation becomes closer and closer to the real world. And that means that the policy we are training in the simulation also becomes better and better at operating in the real world. So this is, I think, a really important topic. And we're, uh, we're working on that also with techniques. You might have heard of something like BASIN, where we are um, updating parameters over these simulation randomizations. And with that, um, uh, I come to the conclusion. So I think overall, um, we've seen great progress, especially due to deep learning and better perception and control capabilities. I think we can now move forward to look at more integrated larger scale manipulation system. Another direction for us that's really important is more industrial, um, like pick and place tasks or in an area called picking or bin picking or kitting. Um, and I think, of course, the techniques that we're developing at NVIDIA are, and, and, and the environment, the ecosystem, compute ecosystem at NVIDIA is really well suited for, for pushing this progress forward. On the one hand side, through the GPU acceleration for real-time deep learning and inference and perception, and also all these um, simulation capabilities in which we can train our robots in, in the future. And um, with that, I'd like to thank the whole team in, in the robotics lab, also our faculty collaborators and various collaborators inside and outside NVIDIA. Um, and I can stop here or I could give you one minute example of some other work we are doing like this here, but I'll leave it up to you. I can just play it when people ask questions. Thank you very much. Great. Thanks very much, Dieter. Uh, so, uh, for folks on the on, on the call, maybe they can prepare their questions. Uh, Abhishek, do you want to ask yours uh, your question from the from the chat? Sure. 
uh, thank you, President, for the great talk. I had a question about the decluttering part. In the decluttering scenario, how is the system able to identify multiplicity of the objects? That is, how does the system recognize that there are you know, two individual objects and not a single conjoint object? Is that an assumption that's being made? You mean for the object detection? Uh, for the decluttering scenario, we're trying to first take off the box and then you know pick up the cup. Well, in this case, so from the planning perspective, the planner assumes that um, it knows the objects and it has a certain state of the environment. And then you can, um, and then let's say you have a target configuration and that the whole idea of this task in motion planning is to come up, they have a full planning framework that reasons about preconditions for certain actions. Uh, and okay. or, or do you mean the one with the unknown objects? Oh, uh, the, the first part, not the, the one with the known objects. So, with the known objects assume, yeah. Yeah. so this planning system, so you might have preconditions that you can only pick up something, for example, um, if it's accessible, for example, right? And then you might realize that a certain object is not accessible. And then you can say, okay, what do I have to do to make an object accessible? This could mean, for example, opening a drawer or putting an object, taking another object out of the way and things like that. So this is all done at the planning level, but again, assuming that you have models of objects so that you can reason about them. And the, the specific um, internship projects for Caden was actually to do this also by reasoning about um, uncertainty of object posts. So for example, um, he might, you might say that you do not know where a specific object is. It's somewhere on the counter, but it might be occluded by another object. So the system then reasons about picking up an object so that you can take a look at the occluded area and figure out whether the object is there. Interesting. So once we have models, all this kind of reasoning can actually be done pretty well. Great, thank you. Uh, any other questions? Jessica Brunner-Kar says, uh, thank you for the great talk, Peter. Uh, are there any questions from the, from the audience? Have one question. Sure. So, um, for the distribution over potential sixty poses, I was wondering mm -hmm. if using history would help. For example, in the in the case of the cup, as you're moving around the cup, you would be able to discard some of the states, given that you have already moved around the cup for a certain um, angle before seeing the the handle of the cup. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. Actually, um, I should have clarified that that is actually happening there because we are doing so these samples, they are not generated on a per image base, but we're doing in particle filtering, we're doing actually tracking over time, which means the, the positions of the object are also updated um, based on the previous estimate. So this is happening automatically through this resampling and reweighting scheme of the particle filter. And we can also have, uh, it's the complicated part is if you, for example, if the camera is moving and the object is moving, then your motion model needs to be kind of what we might say very, very noisy. But for example, if you know the camera is on the end effector of the robot, then you can use that information to refine the motion model from which you sample from one time step to the next. And, and we've done that for, for some part of follow-up research. Okay, thank you. Yep. Cool. Uh, so we're about, uh, so the time is uh, two o'clock. Um, maybe we can uh, land the plane and uh, allow folks to go to their individual uh, meetings. Uh, the meetings will take place in another uh, Zoom link. Uh, before I, uh, before we end this, uh, Tim says, thanks Dieter, I have to head off to office hours for my course, but uh, great talk. Um, so thanks everyone for, uh, for joining and uh, we'll see you uh, next week.